My name is Michael Williams, and this is Theater Through Non-Literature, Juggling 101. For over 15 years, I have been that person promoting the popular entertainments. Now, we can look at the Greeks, and we can say, well, theater starts here where we have our oldest record of drama, but we know it goes back before the Greeks. We know there were people doing flips. We know there were people picking up objects and doing things with them. We know that there were people who were performing way before we had contextualized it. And that's the sort of stuff that intrigues me. And so when we went to this format that we are now all adapting to, I wanted to take advantage and instead of for once teaching a skill to talk about why that skill matters, where it came from, how I got to this point that I'm at right now, telling you about it. The thing is, is that juggling can be found on every continent. Every culture has had it. And we have had a lot of names that it has gone by throughout history. You know, and it continues to thrive. You know, you'll see juggling in a small part of this show, juggling in a small part of this show, juggling in the background of this movie, background of that television program. It constantly appears. It's one of those things that we just get mess, uh, mystified by. Uh, it intrigues us. And it's one of those things that I have done for a very long time in my life. I, for many years, earned my living as a street performer, as a busker. That's really the type of theater that if I were to expound upon and talk about, that would be my bread and butter. But yet I still perform in musicals. I still performed in you know, Shakespeare. I did all those things. But if I had my type of theater, what theater I would like to tell you about, the type of theater that I fight for, it'd be street theater. It'd be the busker. You know, that street performer, that person who doesn't have an audience and the next minute, you know, is surrounded by one. And those are the things that have always intrigued me, especially about <laughs> the manipulation of objects. And so first thing I want to do is tell you that juggling is the manipulation of one or more objects. We're going to be talking about the performers. We're going to be talking about the performance that comes from it not just the skill of throwing an object, dropping an object, or having an object roll around. And that's going to be the purpose of this one. So what qualifies me as the person who should take you on this journey and tell you this story? Well, as I said, you know, I've been doing seminars based on this work for you know, well over 15 years. But before that, my profession was this work, and I did that profession for well over 25 years of my life. I've been juggling since I was a teenager. You know, when I first went to school, it was to train to try and do this. You know, and so I will weave through my story to get to the story of the bigger piece of the puzzle, of where I fit in and where all of it fits in to the theater, the lineage, the how this person connects to this person. And this person knew this person, which trained this person, which is the reason we have this and this and this. That's what we're going to be working for in this and we'll never have enough time to cover all of it. So I've got to start somewhere. And so I'm going to start with this guy. This, the guy at the end wearing the striped shirt, that is Ray Verzell. Ray Verzell was my very first movement teacher uh, at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. But Ray is not a juggler. But he was one of those people who really showed me the opportunities of what movement could be in theater. The backbone of his work is really built upon Spolin and a lot of the work of Tony Montanero, who's really the godfather of American mind. But sitting next to Ray is Dickie Ellis. Dickie Ellis is a guest artist that Ray brought in. Dickie Ellis worked with the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit for many years. And when Ray brought him in as a guest artist at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, Dickie taught me how to juggle. And that was the beginning. And I'm not going to lie to you and say, well, I had to do this, 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 and this to do this. By the end of the first day, I was juggling. It was something that came very easy to me. You know, and like most of us, if I encountered difficulty, I probably wouldn't be telling you the story right now. But it clicked. And from that click... Everything exploded for me afterwards. I was that person who had to understand, had to do more with it. And the last guy getting into that trunk, that's Bob Moyer. 
Bob Moyer is an improvisational artist and was a teacher for many years at the North Carolina School for the Arts, University of North Carolina School for the Arts today. The three of them together had their own performance troupe in which each one handled an aspect of performance that really suited their discipline. But it was Ray who connected me with Dickie. And it was Dickie that finally somehow wound around and got me to this guy. This guy over here, that's John Grimaldi. John means a lot to me because John was the first one who took it from being skill and started introducing it as a performance. John also worked with the Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit. He's also the resident juggler and resident stilt walker for the Metropolitan Opera, which, as you know from the mask behind me, has not been doing a lot lately. But for many years, when you turned on PBS and you saw an opera being performed, there was that juggler in the background. That was John. Stilt walker walking across, hey, that's John, or it was his wife. And so for many years, this has been John's bread and butter. But John was the person who looked at what I was doing and said, hmm, what about this? And have you thought of this? Have you done this? Have you worked on this? Why haven't you thought of doing this, this, and this? And John was the one who finally said to me, you know, you really need to go to the South Paris School of Mime and Clown. Well, I was greatly disappointed to find out that didn't mean Europe. It meant South Paris, Maine. And South Paris, Maine is where Tony Montanaro, whom I mentioned, the godfather of American mime, many, many years ago set up his own school for physical theater. For him, it was a school of mime. Well, Tony basically gets it started, and then some of the best performers I can think of in my field are going to start going through there. Fritz Grove from Blink. You know, you're going to start to have Michael Maness. You know, he comes out of there as a barn brat. Teachers there, Avner Eisenberg, Julie Goel. The names that start to become associated are very important with this place. The Celebration Barn is the sort of place people went to get better because they got there in the winter, it got snowed in, they were trapped for five months, and over five months they improved and improved and defined their skills. Well, it no longer existed as the South Paris, Maine, as I have just stated, by the time I got there, it was the Celebration Barn Theater, and Tony was still alive. And what I learned there was bubble, not brick. And what I'm talking about there is when you see something like this, it shouldn't look like that. It shouldn't look like something just drops, but how to make everything appear light. We didn't focus on skill there. We focused on being a performer, how to take this and make it into something. But this was only a start. It wasn't until I got up and had to then travel across the country that I arrived in Blue Lake, California. And that's where I started going to the conservatory, the Del Arte School of Physical Theater, today Del Arte International. You didn't have a juggling class. That isn't what they were doing. What I learned there is to how to take skill and make it into performance. And it was an incredibly hard lesson. Every Monday, having to appear in front of the faculty, an open audience, in front of your peers, and show what you had created over a week. Handling assignment after assignment. Every week, a performance. Every evening, a rehearsal. And then after rehearsal, the school stayed open so we could go in and work on our own skills on top of it. And so there were many midnights that I was standing in an empty movement room and I was throwing objects, constantly picking up, trying to improve. And so it's from Del Arte that I then went into the field. And that field took me to Renaissance fairs, it took me to street festivals, it took me to Europe. And so this entertainment didn't just come from anywhere. It has a starting point and it's finishing points like looking at a tree going in all directions. So, where do we start with this? Where does this story begin? How do we find it? Well, if we we're to say, hey, you know, this is our oldest record of drama, and so this is where we're going to start teaching, you know, theater. Well, our oldest record of juggling is Egypt. 
Now, as you can see in this, these hieroglyphics show female jugglers. And the pattern that they're using, guess what? It's the same thing we use today. Not much has changed over 4,000 years. But it was important enough in the culture that it actually made it onto the wall. And so it is our oldest record. But it's not our only record, because as we go through Greece, Mesopotamia, Thebes, on vases, on walls and frescoes, we constantly run into different images of juggling. It keeps reappearing. And then we're going to have a big pop when we finally reach the Middle Ages, because juggling becomes one of those mystical arts, which is not always a good thing. But we start to have all these different names for performers, you know, who in their bag of tricks juggle also. Bards, minstrels, you know, jugglers, juglani, you know, zuglani. You know, you can throw all these different terms in there. Even the singing troubadour generally could pick up objects and throw them around. In the Renaissance, juggling becomes such, you know, you, a ubiquitous piece of performing that we are constantly finding different performers doing it. It's a common skill. It's like saying to a carpenter, do you have a hammer? You know, a performer could easily pick up objects and make them do things. But it's not until we reach the 19th century that juggling finally becomes its own art, something that people are going to specialize in. And it's no longer, I sing, I dance, I juggle. It's in the 19th century we start to run into people who just juggle. Now, the circus explodes in the 19th century, and that's going to help out a great deal. However, the explosion of the circus does not solely create this. It also has to do with the type of theater that was thriving at that time, variety theater. And the most popular form of variety theater in the United States was vaudeville. And overseas in Europe, the music hall. And so when we get to this century, vaudeville starts to provide the big ground for performing jugglers. Now, were every juggler who made it you know, through vaudeville, do we know him today? I could wait here all day. And not many people are going to name people for me. But I can tell you this. The man next to me you should know, just by image. That, if you are still wondering, is Charles Chaplin. Now, we know Chaplin today, and I will say, and you know, if you want to argue this, it's fine, but there was no performer in movies more valuable than Charles Chaplin in his day. Director, producer, you know, wrote the score. He did everything. In Chaplin's biography, he actually wrote about, autobiography, sorry. In Chaplin's autobiography, he actually states that his first love was juggling. He wanted to be a juggler, and he was extremely proud of the fact that he had gotten some rubber balls and, balls and some plates to work with. However, you know, unfortunately for Chaplin, or fortunately for all of us, he saw a performance that was going to change his entire view of it. And this is one of those things that was stressed at Celebration Barn, Del Arte, and any place that's really worth its weight. He saw a performance in which a man balanced a pool cue on his forehead. And while balancing the pool cue, Chaplin says that he took out the cue ball, he threw it up, and caught it at the tip of the stick. That is an incredible trick. I've never seen it, but Chaplin says he did. But that isn't what, you know, threw Chaplin through a loop. What threw him through a loop was he reached into his other pocket and he pulled out the eight ball. And he threw the eight ball up and he caught it on top of the cue ball. And then very calmly took everything down and bowed and walked off. And what Chaplin learned that day is that the audience, though in awe, was silent. They weren't roaring, they weren't cheering, and the trick was over with. And regardless of how immaculate that trick was, it did not get everything it deserved because people didn't understand how incredible it actually was. And so Chaplin, though he is going to do a lot of juggling through his career, mainly with hats and canes, 
Uh, at that point, he hung up the dream of being a juggler and focused instead on being a performer. Now, in the U.S., we have another individual, this guy. Now, this is a guy that you should also know. At the beginning of film, this man was huge. This is W.C. Fields. And before he ever made a movie like The Bank Dick, W.C. Fields was a juggler. In fact, he advertised himself as the greatest juggler. And he was a huge hit. Cigar box manipulation, stick manipulation. He would go in there, his ball routine. And as you look at this clip, you know, the reason this clip exists is that in his films, he constantly tried to sink juggling moments into them whether it was at a pool table or right here doing a stage show as a juggler. It was always his first passion. And so all his witty lines that he's going to add in throughout his life, a lot of those lines came because Chaplin saw a skilled juggler. W.C. Fields realized there wasn't going to be the money in the skill. He was a comedic juggler. And there's a world for both of them, but they both have to be performers. What Chaplin saw was a skill demonstration. It did not go as well. The reason that we know W.C. Fields is that people saw a lot of his work. They liked the characters he was building, and W.C. Fields became a star. Not because he was a juggler, but because he used juggling as a vehicle to performance. And that's what made it work. Now, he wasn't the only juggler working in the American vaudeville that people know. This guy behind me, well, that's Bobby May. Now, his posters, and I've hunted long trying to find one of these, had the greatest because they just said Bobby May, or he may not. The reason is, is that Bobby May understood that people weren't going to pay a lot of money to see a juggler, but they'd pay money to be wowed. And so it came down to getting an audience in, and if he got the audience in there, then he could win them over. And so Bobby May was the most skillful juggler in the American vaudeville. You know, now, one of the problems that vaudeville runs into, movies. A lot of vaudeville halls are converted into movie theaters. And it doesn't happen overnight. What occurs is the screen's placed in the back, vaudeville performers were in there, they'll do one of their acts, and then a movie will play. Then another act will go on, and bam, another movie, the double feature will start. Over time, they realize, hey, why don't we just film these vaudeville acts and put them as a pre to the show? And so one of the only reasons we have this footage of Bobby May that you're looking at right now is because it was filmed to show before movies so they wouldn't have to pay him touring all over the place. As tragic as that may have been for his career, it's the only record we really have of Bobby May's greatness. You know, he was a phenomenal performer, incredible skill. And one of the things that he really innovated, he did not juggle tick, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Bobby May used an unsyncopated rhythm. Ball goes here, then ball shoots over there. This is going to be here, that's going to go there. It was always changing. You never knew where the pattern was going to go. This was insane for that time. He's one of our last big jugglers, and he will actually live into the 1970s. And his influence is going to carry on to them. Bobby May hailed out of Ohio. He came in contact with an individual, Dick Franco. Dick Franco became a student of Bobby May's. Dick Franco became one of the most popular jugglers of the 1970s and 80s. And it's at that time he took on a student, a prodigy by the name of Anthony Gatto, who was already performing on The Tonight Show with Joan Rivers as a guest host and later Johnny Carson by the time he was seven. And when we say prodigy, take a look at this. That is a prodigy. That's something that you don't really see. Well, the thing is, is Gatto is a prodigy in the sense that he picks it up quick, but he's also part of the lineage. It's Bobby May coming from vaudeville that passes down over to Dick Franco. 
Dick Franco's using this and performing in casino theaters. He's performing on tours. He's doing the summer stock houses. And he is now passing it down to Anthony Gatto. Anthony Gatto is going on The Tonight Show. Anthony Gatto is making small appearances here and there where there's a little kid juggling in a film. But now when we look at Anthony Gatto, he's one of the lead jugglers who has worked with Cirque du Soleil. He's one of those figures that has made this not only a career, but has changed the art. You know, he is a skill-based juggler who figured out also it's about the performance. And that came from working with Dick Franco, who knew it's about the performance. And that came from working with Bobby May, whose skill was incredible, but at the end of the day knew it's about the performance. That is really where this has to go. And so everything that I've talked about as far as, you know, hey, the skill, the skill, the skill, it's all been rooted in a performance. And that's where we trace it back to even now. Now, these are all skill-based. And as you can see from here, I could show you skill-based performances all day. You can go online and find it. You can go anywhere to find it. And that actually changed the way juggling works. When I started out, I had to have a Dickie Ellis. And Dickie had to pass me on to John. And John instructed me on how to go further, which is where I met a lot of people I would later work with, which then led to me training in other places. But for the most part, to learn this, you had to find people who did this. You didn't just pick up a book, though I did, and it helped out a little bit. But for the most part, you had to learn this by doing it and by seeing other people do it. Bootleg VHS was everywhere. People were hunting it down, paying small fortunes for stuff through mail order. But today, dominantly, I can go online, type in some juggler's name or type in some trick, and I'll get a whole list of what can be seen. A lot of what you're seeing in here is public domain. Why public domain? Because a lot of the juggling that you're seeing here comes from people who have been gone a long time. And some of it was even produced by the WPA. The Federal Theater Project actually had a circus. You know, see this guy? This is a very important American actor. You know, this is an actor who actually took on the blacklist. This is Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas in the 1950s was in the movie The Juggler. And yes, he could juggle. As you can see by this photo of him juggling film cans. You know, it was one of those skills he always enjoyed. I was teaching in Prague. And while teaching in Prague, one of my students came to me. He had gotten a film gig. Now, he was going to be working on The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Awful movie. Awful. However, there's a festival scene when somehow they get a submarine to go into the canals of Venice. And during that submarine scene, there's a brief instance where the festival that's occurring has objects fly in the air and drop. And I was like, Mikal, you know, that's wonderful. I'm so glad. You know, is it a good paid gig? And he looks at me and says, I bought a car. Hell of a skill. They shot the film in Prague to cut down, used splices of scenes from Venice to save on it, and just needed a juggler. And with the exchange rate, the man got a car. And take a look at this film. Hey, The Fugitive. But you know what? There's juggling in it. You know, Gladiator? Yeah, it won an Oscar. Wasn't the greatest film, but look at this scene in the background. Yep, another juggler. Back to the Future. Hey, look, Back to the Future 3. You know, juggler. You know, right there in the back. Doesn't really play a part. Oh, look at this, nine and a half weeks. One of those movies that, you know, your parents have you turn off when they walk in. But guess what? He's walking through the street and there's a guy juggling. Film after film after film, even after animated film after film. It's that skill that keeps showing up. It's a skill that may not take center stage as it did for Chaplin's life, Bobby May's life at one time, or all the others that I will name, but it is still that system and that ability that continues to enthrall us. Now, I just laid out an American lineage, you know, going from Bobby May, but I did mention Chaplin because even though Chaplin was famous in America, we must remember he was British. But European jugglers have their own traditions, their own big names. And there was none larger than Enrico Rostelli. Enrico Rostelli was that individual that everybody turned to and was like, wow, there he is. 
That's the person we should be working for. That's the person that everybody should be trying to emulate. Enrico Rostelli was a numbers juggler. Numbers being that he threw a lot of objects, like in this, where you see him throwing objects while jumping rope. The tragedy to Enrico Rostelli is all the skill you see in this is before he was 25 years old. That's how good he was. And unfortunately, he didn't make it past 25 years old. And as almost a you know, twisted comic relief, he died in a juggling accident. You see, unfortunately, there were no antibiotics, and he did a lot of mouth stick work, which means balancing stuff on a stick that he was holding in his mouth. The stick cracked, cut him, no antibiotics. And so we lost one of the greatest European jugglers early on. You know, Bobby May, yes, he was the great American juggler. If you type in great American juggler into a search engine, generally Bobby's May, uh, Bobby May's name is going to come up sooner or later. That said, a lot of his money came touring in Europe. You know, this was a very big deal. And one of the reasons behind this is in the United States, I like to tell people that as a busker, I'm sometimes viewed as a talented beggar. Yeah. But if I get outside of the U.S., it's actually a lot more pleasant. In fact, you know, inside major cities in the U.S., these accommodations have been being made for a long time. San Francisco has its pier. You know, the French Quarter has Accent Square. You go to New York, a guy gets in a subway car, and he starts to put on his act. Or maybe he just walks in and starts playing a clarinet. And in most of these places, it's now regulated. You actually have to have skill. You just can't actually go up there and do it. And it's not like the Wild West where you show up and somebody says, hey, this is my street corner. Go find your own. And the next thing you know, the cops are raiding the place. In fact, if you're a fan of Night Court, Harry Anderson was a street performer. That's where his career began. Now, he's a magician. He did some juggling on the side, but his core work was magic. He actually was arrested in New Orleans in the 1970s and held through Mardi Gras before they released him to keep him from performing again. You know, it wasn't always on, you know, the performer side. But the streets were the place where you got to develop a lot of this. Just like vaudeville 100 years ago, you know, you weren't going to perform in the big houses until you had a good act. Vaudeville shows were America's most popular entertainment at the beginning of the century. Prices were cheap, but the variety of the acts was enormous. In the ideal vaudeville program, there is a source of complete satisfaction for everybody present, no matter how mixed the audience may be. Just as in every state and city, in every county and town in our democratic country, there is an opportunity for everybody. A chance for all. EFLB. When I talk about Enrico Rostelli or Bobby May, I'm talking about skill jugglers. They were great performers, but to them, the juggling was the performance. It was the vehicle by which they were going to perform. Now, when we talk about W.C. Fields, we're talking about an individual where juggling was not the performance. He was the performer, and juggling was a vehicle that he was using as a performer along with everything else he was going to add into it. Today, we can still separate juggling in these you know, categories, and you should never be rigid with it, because you're always going to find exceptions, you're always going to find something that doesn't fit in. But for the most part, we still have jugglers who are working primarily skill-based, and we still have jugglers who are using it as a vehicle to their performance. It's not about this is what I'm doing. It's what I'm doing with it. You know, if W.C. Fields is doing it in vaudeville, then when we reach the 1970s and 80s, we have the Flying Karametsov brothers. Now, the Flying Karametsov brothers are, in fact, brothers, just not to each other. And the Flying Karametsov brothers in the 1970s achieved such success you could see them on Broadway. You know, they were there for quite a while. They toured all over the U.S. They made it over into Europe. 
And while they're preparing for all this, yes, they started at Ren Fairs. Yes, they started at street festivals. Yes, they were juggling on the pier in San Francisco. They were doing everything, gaining a following and gaining skill. And they were innovators. They weren't only juggling. You know, they were trying to create things with their juggling. You know, they started talking about how improvisation was one of their big goals. It was to try and be like jazz musicians, where anybody could do anything at any time, and the beat would keep going on. And so if somebody threw something here, somebody threw something there, they had one person keeping the beat, and everybody else could improvise, uh, improvise around that beat. And then they added music to it. Not music like choreography, not that, hey, this is what we're going to perform, but music as in the juggling created the music. You know, this was very innovative for the times. And yes, they were funny, but they weren't skill level jugglers like Bobby May. They weren't skill level like Enrico Rostelli. They weren't doing the most amazing juggling. They were doing amazing things with their juggling. For me, personally, it was at the Renaissance Fair in Texas that I had, you know, an incredible experience that put me on this path, that took me to Celebration Barn, that brought me over to Del Arte. And also set me on a path where skill was important, but unless I could perform the skill, it wasn't going to save me. And that was the Flaming Idiots. Yes, I know. What a name. And when you take a look at what they're doing right here, yeah, it doesn't seem like they would be the great inspiration, but they too would make it to Broadway. Years and years, over 20 years of Renaissance festivals, developing skill, performing on small comic strip shows, you know, making it to, you know, the new vaudeville movement that erupted in the 70s and 80s. They continue to try and find that audience. And even when they made it to Broadway, you know, people still have to be dragged when you say it's a juggling performance, you know. When you say it's a comedy performance, it goes over better. And then they get there, it's some of the best juggling you're going to see. And though they also weren't the skill level of Bobby May or Rostelli, they were good. They were real good. And in their heyday, you know, I saw them and I just became set on, this is where I'm headed. Now, there were a lot of people who evolved out of the 70s and 80s you know, going into these two different styles. But the team that probably summed it up best, you know, here's a team, and you probably don't recognize it. But the big guy, you probably recognize a lot better with his partner when you see this image. This image you recognize as Penn and Teller. Penn Gillette is a juggler. Penn Gillette did not start doing card tricks or anything amazing until he met Teller. Teller is a magician, but Penn is a juggler. And Penn, miraculously, happened to grow up in Connecticut next to Michael Motion. In Penn's own words, Michael Motion is the most important juggler of the 20th century. Michael Motion is a MacArthur Grant recipient because of his juggling. He has a PBS special that came on in the early 90s in motion with Michael Motion. You know, he is the choreographer for Cirque du Soleil. And they've actually paid him a fortune to come up with the routines and then scrap them because they were too technical. I remember Steve Regrets once said that the problem is his work was so hard, they might as well have given us balls made of lead. It was very demanding work. But one of the problems that they ran into for Michael Motion is how do you market somebody whose juggling doesn't fit any of the previous stuff? Now, here's the thing. Michael Motion is a skilled juggler, just like Bobby May and just like Enrico Rostelli. But Michael Motion isn't throwing things. He's manipulating them. Probably the most you know, commercial endeavor Motion ever had was working with Jim Henson. If you have seen the film Labyrinth, 
and you've seen David Bowie holding those crystal balls, if you've seen that ball rolling all over him, that was Michael Motion. Not only was that Michael Motion, but Michael Motion was standing behind David Bowie, who was wearing a special jacket, so Motion's arms were in front of him, and Motion was doing all that stuff without even seeing what he was doing. He just knew it. You know, and after people saw that, there were so many people attempting it, and it was hard. The stuff you saw me doing with the orange ball, that was inspired by Michael Motion. I worked at it all the time trying to get it. Michael Motion laid down a flag, and a lot of people went in that direction, and that became the new skill. You know, he was marketed as a performance artist, but he was a juggler. People started to say, hey, it's the new vaudeville. But he didn't fit anything from the old vaudeville. You know, he was an innovator. You know, he was the individual who took the art and moved it forward. Just like the Karametsov brothers took what was being laid by the W.C. Fields and those before and moved it further. These are artists who evolved the form. I can trace this all the way back to Egypt. And we can go all the way to a timeline to this point now. And it still has the basics. It's still built on the same foundation. However, it continues to grow. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, juggling, just like all fields in performance, its hands aren't clean. If you go to a juggling convention, just like people go to a science fiction convention or a fantasy convention, uh, convention there aren't many women. And in fact, I can name most of the women. You know, probably the most popular of the female jugglers in the United States, Cindy Marvell. And, you know, as I say that, I know nobody has any idea who I'm talking about. But Cindy Marvell was an incredible juggler, and she did this for a profession for many years. But nobody knows who she is. You know, and there are a lot of other female jugglers who just get overlooked. Kaziah Tannenbaum went to Del Arte decades before I got there. You know, who is she? Well, she was the juggler with Air Jazz. You know, people know the company, and some people know Peter Davison, you know, the leader of the company for the most part, but nobody thinks about Kaziah Tannenbaum. And so juggling has its own sins associated with it, just like every other. And also the fact that most jugglers are white. All the people I've been naming, Enrico Rostelli, Bobby May, Michael Motion, Penn Gillette, you know, the same sins that existed at the turn of the century in variety theater, well, they existed in juggling. You know, if I look at it, I can point out minstrel jugglers. It was a skill, and it was the times that they existed in that said, hey, this is how we're going to perform this skill. You know, the history of it is tied to the theater. When the theater changed, juggling changed. When theater started to go avant-garde, you get things like Michael Motion. When theater started putting on stuff like Hello, Dolly! again, you end up with things like the Karametsov brothers. You know, juggling evolves with our time. It's always part of who we are now. I've been juggling for over 20 years. For 20 years, I've been struggling with it. And, you know, I only struggle more and more the older I get. You know, you look at this, hey, at one time I was a lot thinner. I had a lot more sharpness to me. Years ago, I went and saw Michael Motion in performance, and afterwards, he and I were sitting on the stage, you know, just, you know, shooting the sh We'll probably have to edit that out. But that said, in our conversation, he had told me how he inherited his grandfather's diaries and was shocked because his grandfather was an engineer. Now, Grandpa Motion, in his diaries as an engineer, when he opened them up, he thought he was going to see all this technical information. What he found was writings about light and writings about, writings about color. His grandfather was interested on how when light hit a building, how did the building look when the sun changed its angles? And when you look at Motion's work today, Motion's work comes from an inspiration not from throwing objects, but from trying to figure out what I can take with this object and make with it. The Karametsov brothers, yes, very good jugglers, not a Bobby May, 
you know, if we're looking for the ghost of Bobby May, Anthony Gatto is where we're going to find it today. But they're taking a look and saying, well, what can I do with this now? And they create music. And the Flaming Idiots, well, they were just the funniest guys I ever saw pick up a, you know, a set of clubs and just go for it. The timeline is simple to follow. The evolution is not. You know, today I could talk hours and hours about who does this work and who's great at this work. But at the end of the day, you know, what it comes down to is that it's actually part of the theater. It's always been part of the theater. I have trained probably over 3,000 jugglers. At SCTC alone over the last five years, I've probably given it about 500 jugglers. You know, there's me and then there's Sam, this guy who I have worked with for quite a while, Sam Wallace. And Sam has come to my workshops and I go to his and we work the room as best we can. I don't know what we're producing, but we're producing a lot of jugglers. And so thank you for attending this. Thank you for listening to you know, me ramble on about you know, the history of theater through non-literature, which juggling is squarely in. And it's not just a skill when aptly you know, applied. You know, it's not just throwing objects. It's not just about dropping things. Sometimes it's about mastering how it works in your hand, just making something come to life. It's like I said, make a bubble, not a brick. How do I make something seem to float? Ballet dancers work on this all the time. Jugglers aren't too far behind that. Thank you for attending. Ciao.